Five five zip. <clears throat> well, that might be dangerous. All right, let's go get it. All right. I'm ready when you are. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, Jonathan. God is good. It's good to fellowship with the people of the Lord. Amen. Um, uh, I just wanted to share something real quick before we get started. Um, my Diana, good morning. Good to see you. Hi. Wow. Sorry, I'm late. I uh, my my brain works in kind of a weird way. I've, I've always got a, you know five or six subjects that I kind of cycle through. <coughs> When, when my mind is wandering, I often come back to this one subject. I was listening to an audio book a few months ago, maybe three, four months ago, and um, the, the author had written about how there are so few things in life that don't have boundaries after which it's no longer a good thing. Um, all the good things that we think about in, in life, almost all of them, you can have too much of a good thing, right? So, um, you know, when it comes to uh, time with your family, time with your family is a good thing. It's a very good thing. Um, but you can have so much time with your family that you never go to work. <laughs> that, that's a problem, <laughs> right? Um, you know, this person, the author was an economist, it's okay, uh, you know, you can, you can have a job, and you can, and hours at your job where you get paid for each hour is a good thing, but you can have too many hours at work, in that now you're not spending any time with your family, or doing other things. If your job required you to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that would not be a good thing. Mm -mm. That's slavery. Um, you talked about charity. Charity is a good thing. You want to give charitably, but you can have too much charity, in which case you give away all of your money and now you are poor. Or society gives so much that the poor never have any incentive to work. Um, you talked about you can, law is a good thing, right? It's good to have law and order, but you can have too much law. In the abundance of law, there is no justice. You can have so many laws, and many feel that that's, this is the case in, in our society now, there's so many laws, tens of thousands of pages, pages of law, you can't even know what all the laws are. And so, if somebody wanted to, they could find you guilty of something. Mm -hmm. So Law is a good thing, but you can have too much of it. Almost everything, you can have too much of a good thing. This morning during prayer, Steve was praying, and, and he said, there's never a bad time to thank the Lord. Amen. Amen? There's no boundary to that one. There's no too much of a good thing in thanking the Lord. When your heart is in a position of thankfulness to the Lord, there's never a wrong time for that. There's never too much of that. You can go to sleep thanking the Lord and dream thanking the Lord. You can spend time with your family and thank the Lord. You can go to work and thank the Lord. While you're driving, you can be thanking the Lord. While you're doing your chores at home, you can be thankful to the Lord. There's no wrong time for it. Amen? Amen. This morning, we've got a great opportunity to exercise this good thing that has no boundaries. Thank and so you. I encourage you, don't put any boundaries on your worship or your thankfulness uh -huh. to the Lord this morning. Why don't you rise to your feet and lift up your voice to, to God who is always good, always faithful, always loving towards us. Lord, we lift you up and pray that you will be blessed in our time this morning. Amen. Jonathan, Amen. before we start, um, it is 
it has always been a privilege and an honor to uh, to, to play music for me. It's always been it's always been uh, my happy time. It's always been my happy time, and um, for many many years I have played both in the secular world and in the the Christian world. Um, my heart doesn't differentiate between the two. Uh, it's just the joy that, that overwhelms me. Um, never as much though as when I'm working with, with Steve. Steve, you've, you've, you've just blessed, you've just blessed my, uh, my, uh, my music and uh, mm. just want to thank you. Although the first time I, I, I met Steve, I said to my wife, that is the weirdest human being. <laughs> 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 I resemble that remark. And Steve never, Steve never proselytized to me, with me. Uh, he just, he just loved me. And uh, well, many times, for many years, I've looked out from behind a keyboard, and and this morning I'm seeing smile, smiling faces are good. I don't know about you, Steve. I don't know if, if you've ever seen this when you're up here worshiping. <laughs> very disheartening. Yeah. <laughs> very disheartening. It's very, very disheartening. It does not stop me from being a lunatic, but it's very disheartening. <laughs> anyway, recently I have read this quote uh, from a well respected Christian scholar and author by the name of William Barclay. Now, Addy, if you don't recognize this man, then we won't consider him a well-respected. Do you recognize that name? Well, uh -oh. Uh -oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> and this is what uh, Mr. Barkley says. The Christian is the man of joy. Amen. Amen. The Christian is the laughing cavalier of Christ. Amen. My mother's maiden name is Cavalier. Oh, nice. <laughs> My mother's maiden name. A, a gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms, and nothing in all religious history has done Christianity more harm than its black clothes and long faces. Ooh. So I want to ask you, is anyone, the Mayans are a little bit in dark clothing, but I <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut them a break. <laughs> no long faces. Amen. 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 Uh, this isn't a comment on his uh, the content of what Danny shared, but I think his mic is still a little hot. And I want everyone to look at my feet. Yeah, kicks. See these awesome shoes? <laughs> I'm styling. Yeah, you're styling. And I tried to dress, dress a little more. Am I getting there? I want you to turn to somebody and just ask him this question. Can you tell me something, anything, that you're thankful for? And I want to tell you a story. I went to college, and I think it's a crazy idea to send kids off to a place that away from their parents and just cut them loose and see what happens. I think it's kind of a crazy idea. I'd like to talk to the person that invented that idea. But anyway, I remember being in college. I was not a Christian. And I saw my friend, one of the guys I played rugby with, and in the middle of the night, his friend, so-called friend, had shaved off one of his eyebrows. Yeah. This is like a week before graduation. When he was asleep, he just shaved it off. And I never at that moment was so glad that I had two eyebrows. I mean, it sounds silly, right? But when Facebook first started, I found Klug. His name is Klug. That's his nickname. And I said, Klug, I could get really down, and I have to try to find something to be thankful for. And all I got to do is remember how weird you look with one eyebrow. And I could just look in the mirror and laugh and say, I'm glad I got two eyebrows. I mean, sometimes, come on, sometimes you got to start small. It's hard. When you're down, it's not easy to give thanks. But like that old hymn says, count your blessings, name them one by one. It'll surprise you what the Lord has done. You just start, you start it. You got to start it. So talk to somebody, just tell them one thing you're thankful for, and then it turns into another thing and something else I'm thankful for. And pretty soon you're the richest person in the room. Go ahead, just tell somebody.
Every good thing comes from God. Every good and perfect gift. In Thailand, and some of us were raised with this, you know, when you go to somebody's house, you just don't come empty handed. You know, that's just something about that. It's just like, you know, if you can, you bring something. Yes. And you say, I'm so glad to be here. And you give them a little something. Now we all said something we're thankful for. I want you to actually take that thing now as if it was a present and enter God's gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Just imagine if we were just coming into the presence of the Lord like those wise men came and they, what'd they do? They presented their gifts before the Lord and they worshiped him. Just give him, even just that one thing, even I'm going to just give him this, uh, this one eyebrow that I got so that I got two. I'm going to give him my eyebrows and just say, wow, thank you, Lord. I still have eyebrows. Come on, can you do it? Just lay it before God. Just say, thank you, Jesus. I'm entering into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. You're so good. You're so good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. He has done great things. See what our Savior's done. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done a big pile of them. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, we dance in your freedom and I'm not sure if me wiggling around here really qualifies as dancing but I want you to just start to say wait a minute I gotta love God with all my what? heart I gotta love God with all my what? mind I think Jesus sort of expanded a little on the Old Testament there and it's with all my soul and with all my strength so I want to know how can I worship God with all my strength and not use at least a couple of my muscles? What do you think, Mrs. Smitty? We dance in your freedom. Thank you, Lord. 
God and King. His love endures forever, for He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Witness 
for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Let's do that first verse. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life, I'm in that place once again. Song. Thank you for sharing that, uh, that quote. That was really <laughs> on, point. on point. Yes. Um, it, that, that is so true. We have more reason to be thankful, to be cheerful than anyone in the world. Um, and if that's not coming through, then some sort of lie has gotten through, some sort of deception um, is in play. If we're not cheerful, thankful, um, ex expressive of the love of God, not just expression, expressing, but expressions of the love of God. Well, Pastor Rick's not with us this morning. He is in 
Colombia, Cartagena, Colombia, um, with the saints down there. And the report there has been really great. Um, the, the specific church that we supported of, of the array of churches is growing, starting new churches. Um, the ministry there is strengthened, they're encouraged. Um, people are getting saved, baptized, discipled. Pray Lord, thank you so much for what you're doing in Cartagena, Colombia. Pray that it spreads, Lord, to to the rest of Colombia, that that nation would be turned around um, and raised up out of um, its current situation, Lord, um, and that Colombia would be a, become a place that sends out missionaries and, and evangelists to the rest of the world. Lord, I pray that the success that there, the church is seeing in Colombia would be brought back here, Lord. Uh, as we sow into Colombia, the church there would sow into us that we would get a, um, a, a part of what they've got um, in winning souls to you, Lord, and, and planting churches and discipling, um, that there would be this cross-pollination, Lord, and we would see that in the North Country. So pa Pastor Rick... Um, he has his uh, negative COVID test, test, still need to get a negative COVID yeah. test for Alan Daniel so that they can um, return to the U.S. in a timely fashion. So continue to pray in that regard. Um, we also are still missing Allison. She's still in the hospital. Um, all reports recently have been very positive. Um, you know, when, when we prayed together as a church, I think it was about... 11 days ago. I, I don't know about you, but I got a strong sense from the Holy Spirit. She's going to come through um, through all of this. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't pray. So I've been continuing to pray. We've, we've been continuing to pray. And I believe Allison's going to be with us again soon. Um, strong and healthy as ever. Let's pray that through to completion. Um, Let's look ahead a little bit. Um, coming up soon are going to be the Christmas carol performances. Those are going to be on the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th of December. I encourage you to come out and see um, those, one of those performances at CFC Madrid. Um, Charles Dickens' Christmas carol um, is a very well-known piece of literature, piece of, now, now a piece of uh, stage performance um, that despite Charles Dickens not really being particularly, uh, you know, in the things of God, the truth within it is really rich um, that if you are thankful before the Lord, it changes your entire life. Um, and uh, the performers, I, I mean, I've, I saw it two years ago, much of the cast is is the same, really great performances, um, but really the message of, of the show uh, is what you come away with. Um, further down the line still, at the end of January, January 29th, there will be a conference for the young people. Um, it's called the Awake Conference. That's gonna be the 29th of January, CFC Canton. We'll have more details going forward, but if you've got um, young people, uh, that can be on your calendar. And then much further down the road will be a missions trip to Turkey in the May of 2022. Um, if you are interested, um, I don't know how long it's going to be. I would imagine it's going to be at least a week um, uh, in the country of Turkey. Uh, if you're interested, reach out to Pastor Eric Trulise uh, for details. He'll be heading that effort up. Um, the Trelises were missionaries in Turkey, I think it was six years. Um, they they um, brought several children into the world while they were out there. Um, their children's young lives were in Turkey. Um, they still have many contacts there, and the church that they left behind has been growing. And, um, new people have been getting saved. Turkey is not a particularly welcoming place to the gospel. 
Um, and yet, the Lord is meeting people there. Um, so, again, if you're interested, reach out to Pastor Eric. This morning we've got uh, David Tullock with us. Again, always a treat to have him here preaching. Feels like it's becoming a regular thing, and I'm okay with that. Um, so we're going to bring up uh, uh, David in a few minutes. Um, Clyde, would you help us with uh, the offering? Um, and uh, Clarissa Hastings is going to be handling Children's Church. Thank you again, Clarissa. Right on short notice, I texted the Hastings last night and is not doing well. Clarissa is ready. It's a real blessing. Um, so any children who are going... Yes, Steve. Just greetings from the Dodges. They said yes, they that's right. They're out uh, visiting family. They won't be back till like December 5th. Yep. We sent their love and uh, wanted everybody uh, to know they are thinking of. Yes, the Dodges. We haven't seen them for a few weeks because they've been self-quarantining at request of their children so that they could go out and visit them, which they are now. Um, so they'll, they'll be away for a few more weeks. Um, and uh, Lord bless them in their travels. We pray that their time with family would be rich and meaningful and that you would meet them there. Um, any children who are going to be uh, participating in Children's Church Running, go ahead and stand. Lord, thank you so much for the ministry to young people. We pray that these lessons will be lasting, uh, that the truth of your word would go down deep into their hearts. We bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Clyde, are, are we ready? Are you ready? All set. Okay. <coughs> All set? Okay. All right, David, we'll have you come share the word. Um, David's been a faithful uh, minister on staff, helping in a number of areas. Um, and we look forward to sharing the word. Open your hearts and open your Bibles. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, as uh, always, it's a privilege and a blessing to be here. Uh, yeah, it's just always great to come out. And I guess the last time I was here, we were, we were in Judges at the beginning, and I think I was preaching on Ehud and Shamgar and Othniel, and so uh, I had a great time in that study. Did anybody else like just have a great time in the book of Judges? I feel like that was just so rich and stirring. And it's actually been really hard for me to like get out of judges mode. I've just been like fixated, which maybe isn't a bad thing. But <clears throat> this morning, I'm just going to share what I hope uh, just an encouraging and really, I hope, simple message from the Lord. I was just trying to think, man, what am I going to share? Originally, I went to Hebrews, went to some other places. And where I landed was in Isaiah 40, 9, 10, and 11. And just because it stirred me, it was just a simple, I was like, wow, I needed that. It's kind of like a... Like when you walk outside and it's like a beautiful fall morning, you're like, oh, what's going on here? And it was kind of like that for me. And so that's where we're going to be this morning. And so I'm just going to pray and we're just going to jump into this and, and just, just trust the Lord that he's going to move and, and that we can really receive from him this morning. So dear Jesus, we just love you. Lord, we come today, Lord, hungry for your truth, hungry for your word. Lord, hungry just to be conformed into your image, Lord Jesus. Lord, I just ask, Lord, as I speak, Lord, help me to speak well, Lord, help us to hear well, Lord, help us just to apply in our own lives in unique ways, Lord, your truth. So, Lord, I just pray even just simply, Lord, that each of us would leave here with just some small nugget, Lord, just something we can take with us, Lord, to apply to our hearts, to apply to our families, to apply to our workplaces, to our lives, Lord Jesus. So, Lord, just move, have your way, Lord, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So Isaiah 40, 9, 10, and 11. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead 
those that are with young. As I've been uh, just living life this past little bit, I was at my house, and we're just like, I don't know, in full kid mode. And I'm one of those people who does not think about the holidays until they're basically here. Uh, I'm, I'm very bad about that. And I look over at my neighbors, and my neighbors have, like, Christmas tree up, lights up, ribbons up, wreath up. Like, I'm like, whoa. And I'm like, I'm like when's Thanksgiving? Like, in, in my mind, I'm not even close to there. And they're just full Christmas mode. It's like, bam, all of a sudden I turn to my right, and they're just in full celebratory Christmas mode. And it kind of struck me. I'm like, whoa, that's coming. Like, that's, that's coming pretty fast. <laughs> and as I read this, I was just kind of struck afresh with, man, the Lord is coming, and we're celebrating this wonderful truth. And Isaiah just speaks of this wonderful truth time and time and time again. And I was really just kind of freshly stirred with, man, I want to celebrate afresh Christ. Emmanuel, Christ with us, God with us. And that that's so simple, but yet at the same time, I look over at my neighbors, and I'm like, they're not believers. They, they don't know the Lord. And here, they're, they're all riled up about Christmas, but it's just a holiday for them. It's just fun. In a real sense, I was like, man, I want to redeem this. I want to redeem Christmas. That here, people in the world, we're swept up in this frenzy. We're swept up in this joyous occasion. I'm not saying there's even necessarily anything wrong with being celebrating Christmas to be excited about it. But here, in a sense, I was like, man, they're like pumped up over nothing. And they are pumped. And it's like, I want to be pumped up. I don't want it just to be a small thing. I don't want it to be just a passing thing. Oh, yeah, we're at Christmas. We're in Advent. We're coming up to it. Jesus, yeah, we're going to celebrate Jesus being born. Man, I want that just to saturate who I am. I want that to be the lens through which my whole life is lived. In Madrid, we've been preaching on Luke, and in Luke 1, 26 through 33, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph to the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came and said to her, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Beautiful. He will be great. He will be great, the Son of the Most High. He will sit on the throne of David forever. And even there, as we're as we're working through this, I'm thinking again, I'm like, we just went through this judges where it's just disaster after disaster where the judge is raised up and yet he dies and the nation fails and they're like looking for this king. They're like, someone come and deliver us permanently forever. Someone be our king. Even at the end, we see the nation come together due to horrible sin in, the, in their own camp. They come together finally kind of preparing the way for the, king, for the kingdom. And yet the kingdom still is lacking, and here finally we see this Christ, the great king, the chosen one, the son of God, the ruler of the throne of David. And so today, this is where I want us to set our gaze, our hope. This is where I want us just to freshly see this fundamental truth to stir our hearts, to stir our lungs, to stir our minds, to be focused on Christ. The world ramps up for the holiday season like my neighbor, and I think for us, you know, it's a good thing. Like we have these, you could say, church calendars. Some churches have tremendous, you know, liturgical calendars. But even for us, it's a good thing as we come to Christmas to freshly fix our gaze on what's going on, that Christ has come into the world. Just to be freshly stirred by that, just to say, hey, 
let's take some time out of the year and let's just focus our gaze that God came to us, was born as man to us, to bear our sin, to bear our shame, to make a way where there was no way. Let's take some time. Not in the frenzy of the world, not in the materialism of the world, but in a real way, let's focus in. I think the lens of our life, like we can get fixated on things and they become kind of a lens, even temporary. Like even just, I just shared when we were going through Judges, it's like I couldn't process life outside of Judges. I don't know if that happened to you. It's like everything I'm thinking about is going through this lens of Judges. Because I'm reading Judges. All I'm doing is studying Judges. I'm just in Judges. I'm in three, you know, we're doing it at youth. I'm doing it in Ogdensburg. We're doing it at church. So it's just this constant bombardment of Judges. And it's like, whoa. This becomes the lens through which I start to see. I remember even as a child, I think it was in sixth or seventh grade, and for part of the school year, we had to memorize the Gettysburg Address. And so every day, what was I doing? Saying the Gettysburg Address. And it's funny how when you say and you do things, all of a sudden it's like all I'm thinking about, all I'm fixated on, all that's going through my mind all the time is this Gettysburg Address. And so I think in our minds, like we're easily wrapped up in stuff. And here the world gets wrapped up in Christmas, but it's a Christless Christmas. And for us, well, let's get wrapped up in Christmas, but let's get wrapped up in Christ. Let's have that focus that there's nothing wrong with setting apart a month or whatever it may be to really be stirred up and like, hey, this is where I'm going to set my gaze this month. Just like we set our gaze on judges, well, let's set our gaze on Christ. Let's be stirred up in that. Let's stir our family up in that. Even me and Caitlin just bought a, uh, like we normally get those little, like, uh, what are they called? The, now I'm blanking on the word. The, uh, the little, like, um, calendars that you open the doors. What are they called? Advent calendar. There you go. I'm having, like, completely mental blank. And we normally get those little advent calendars. Like, you pop the door open and there's chocolate or something. But this year we got one. It's like a Playmobil advent thing. And each day you take a little toy out. And then at the end of it, like, it builds a whole little Playmobil nativity. But even that, it's like, man, I want to ha- cultivate some way to set my kids' focus on what are we doing here? This is special. This is unique. So, again, here in Luke 1, we see Christ is coming, Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. The great son, the most high. He's coming. And so why do I read Isaiah 40? Why is that? Because I just think for here, it's just, there's a great application for us. There's a great application. In the first section, go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Here, as Isaiah is writing, Israel's in one of its lowest points. They're in the midst of a Syrian war. They're kind of between this point of Assyrian captivity and Babylonian captivity. It is a mess. And what does Isaiah say? Go up, declare it, lift up your voice, fear not. I love this this passage in Isaiah because it's this beginning part, it's full of action. And as we come to Christmas, it's like, man, I want I want to act. I want to do something. So what do we do? We go up. Like let's do something. Let's go up on the mountain. Let's move and actually set rhythms in our life to celebrate this monumental occasion. Let's go up, like even here as you were as we were we were, Steve was saying, like, we, we celebrate what the Lord has done. What are you thankful for? You know, we remind ourselves of this. We actually do something to act, even in small actions. Again, it, it focuses our hearts, our minds. I love the movement in this passage that we go up. Action is required. Go up. Go up. And then what do you do? What do you do when you go up? Well, you herald. And what do you herald? The good news. So you go up and then you speak forth the good news. 
that we have good news. My neighbors who are Christmas crazy, you could say, they don't have good news. All they have is Santa and plastic and just stuff. They just have some pagan celebration. We have good news. And we need to go up on the mountain and herald it to the world. And even more importantly, we need to herald it to ourselves and the people around us, as we'll see here in a minute. The call is to come up on the mountain, to go, to vocalize, to speak. And then what, is, what, is, what does Isaiah say? He says, with strength and without fear. With strength and without fear. That, man, this is our call. This is our call, to speak the truth, the good news. The world does not have good news, and yet we do. And here at Christmas, it's so, I'm just like some, even here, I'm like stumbling in my mind that the whole world sets its gaze, and yet where is Christ? Where is Christ? They go up on the mountain, but they herald largely worldliness. And here we have this chance to herald the good news of Jesus Christ, to herald the coming king, to herald the coming kingdom, to herald the hope and the salvation of all who will turn and believe in him. And we do it with strength that was bought for us in the blood of Christ, and we do it with a fearlessness that was bought for us in the blood of Christ. Where he goes, we follow. And he went with strength, and he went without fear before man with good news. So where are we called to go up on the mountain where it's visible, where we can be heard, where we can boldly proclaim this good news? Where is that in your life? You know, might say, well, it's on a street corner or wherever it might be. I mean, it may be. That may be. But I think here one of the special things of this is if we look at this beginning of this passage, go up on the high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, say to the cities, of Judah. So where is Isaiah saying, where are you going to speak this? To yourself. Where are you going to speak this? You're going to speak this to the covenantal people of God. And I think there again, something special for us, something that I'm, I'm like here, I want to cultivate in my family, is we need to speak this truth, herald this good news to one another. Why? Because we need it. We need to be freshly reminded of the goodness of God. That Christ has come. That here, Isaiah is saying, speak this to the people of God. Speak it to Judah, Jerusalem, and Zion. Our voice matters. Your voice matters. If you've been touched by the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, you're called, you're chosen to herald the good news. And your voice matters. I remember... uh, there's a children's book, like Horton. I think it's Horton Hears a Who. You ever, there's probably a movie about that, too. I think there is. I think I've seen it with my kids. And in Horton Hears a Who, we see Horton, this giant elephant, and he finds like this speck. I think it's called a speck of dust or whatever it may be. And he finds this speck, and on the speck, he hears something. And no one believes him. No one believes that there's people on the speck of dust. And Horton's like, no, there's a whole world on this speck of dust. And because he has these huge ears, he can hear the Who's on the speck of dust. And as the story unfolds, people think Horton's crazy, and eventually they're going to destroy the speck of dust, and they have like this huge celebration where they're going to boil the speck of dust in bezel nut oil, I think is what they call it. And Horton is yelling at the Who's. He's like, make as much noise as you can. And all the Who's are like banging things and playing trumpets and screaming, trying to get everybody to hear them. And then eventually they find like this one little girl who is asleep, And they make her scream, and it's like her voice mixed with the multitude. All of a sudden, there's enough noise that the people hear, and they're like, whoa, Horton, you weren't crazy. There's people on the speck of dust. It's not a perfect illustration, but the idea is like, our voice matters. Like, I need you to herald the good news, and you need me to herald the good news, and I need you to herald the good news to me, and I need me to herald the good news to you. Like, we need each other. John Piper uses this great illustration of just saying, you know, he's at this big church, and he said one of the most powerful things that ever happened to him is when he was sitting in the front at worship, and the worship would just sweep over him from behind him. 
And he would just look over his shoulder and he'd just see people worshiping the Lord. And he'd be like, man, I didn't feel like worshiping the Lord today. I didn't feel like being here today. And what they were praising for me, they were saying, go up, lift up your voice. They were heralding the good news to him. And so there, your voice matters. And right here, like at this celebratory moment, the celebratory season, man, lift up your voice and start with the people of God. You know, that may be an easy place to start. Sometimes we think like we got to go way out. Man, we need each other to remind each other of the good news of Jesus. Christ is coming. Christ is coming. Christ has come. Christ will come again. So we lift up our voice with strength, and we lift it up, we fear not. We lift it up with strength. Isaiah 41, right before this, I am your God, I will strengthen you and help you. We lift it up, we fear not, 2 Timothy 1, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And so what do we lift up? We go to the high mountain, we lift up our voice, we fear not, we say to the cities of Judah, what's the content of our of our exaltation, of our declaration, behold your God. Behold him. Behold your God. Behold the Lord comes with might. In his arms he rules for him. Behold his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Behold your God. What's the subject of our declaration? God. Behold God. Behold him. Behold him again and again and again. Behold God. I love this counseling method. There's, there's, it's kind of a simplistic, I don't, it doesn't necessarily solve everything, but I know quite a few, like even intensive, where people will go and they'll stay um, in this like live-in counseling center. And one of the methods they use is instead of trying to solve all the problems, instead of like trying to say, well, let me solve every single thing that's ever gone long in your life, all they try to do is just get people there and then show them God. Just behold God. Okay, like you're struggling, you have all these issues. Well, let's just aim you at Christ and see what that does. Let's just intensively focus your gaze on Jesus for a month and see how that changes some of the addictive or the destructive or the sinful tendencies in your life. Before we even dive into those, let's just focus you on Jesus. I love it. So what do we do? We behold our God. We fix our gaze upon him. And here again, this time of year, what a wonderful opportunity just to carve out some time to behold the Lord. To sing to one another, to bless one another, to celebrate with one another, to celebrate with our children, our families, our friends. Behold our God. There's even that song, I love it, Behold our God by sovereign grace. Behold our God, seated on the throne, come let us adore him. Behold our king, nothing can compare, come let us adore him. What does it mean to behold? To focus on intently, to see, but like detailed, to really look. And so there again, we come, we herald this good news, and the good news is that we behold our God, and here again, We need this for one another. I think there's one of the most beautiful things about the body of Christ, even as we're worshiping this morning, is like often we know each other. And that's a good thing. And there again, when you're with a bunch of people you know and you see them worshiping the Lord, you're like, well, man, I know that person's child, like they're in rebellion and that's hard on them. Or I know that person's struggling with cancer or I know that person had a loved one die in the past, or I know that person's struggling financially, or I know that person maybe even has besetting sins that they really struggle with, and yet we're all here broken, worshiping the Lord? And so there again, it's like, whoa. All of a sudden, when I look over and I see someone worshiping the Lord, and I know, man, they're in a hard place, it just builds me up. So we behold our God and we behold him together in our our corporate gathering is so powerful because we know one another and because we all come here from different places raising the name of Jesus because he's good, because he's worthy, because he's in control. Rick Crisotello uh, told me that just wonderful story. It really stuck with me of after his son Mark died. And uh, what did he do? He, He forced himself 
He said he went in the shower and forced himself just to sing praises to the Lord. Because even though everything in him was like, just wrecked, at the same time, he's like, God is good. And I'm going to praise him. Even now, in this lowest of lows, I'm going to praise him. I'm going to choose to praise the Lord. I'm going to go up to the mountain, and I'm going to behold the Lord. That really touched me. And there, us together, we behold the Lord. And when we see each other taking, we sing, we see each other coming and getting communion. Even when I, I'm there at youth group on Monday nights and I see the youth praising the Lord, it just stirs me. I'm like, it just builds me up. And so we come, we go up, we declare the good news of Jesus, and then we behold the Lord. We behold him. He is the content of our declaration. This infant who is mighty yet comes to a poor virgin girl, to a carpenter, to be despised, to be rejected, no nobility, who Isaiah 11 calls a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Who is Jesus? Who are we beholding? He's the cut down stump that there's a little shoot springing from the side of. There's hope. There's life. Who do we come and behold? We become and we behold the suffering servant. We come and behold him who was beaten and rejected. It's beautiful. I love this declaration because it, it again, turn our gaze to Christ. It calls us to set our gaze on Christ and to do it together. To do it together. Hebrews 11 and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as the day draws near. We go up, we declare, and then we behold. We declare, and then we behold. I love this, this idea of beholding because I think it's something the world just does. We as people behold all of human history is just filled with humans beholding all kinds of things. And really, what we behold eventually transforms us. It transforms us. What you behold transforms you. Whatever you set your gaze on, detailed, long enough, will become part of who you are. We see it in all kinds of world religions. We see it in all kinds of materialism. We see it in all kinds of work. We see it even in simple things like sports and, you know, I mean, people who are diehard sports fans who've been beholding the same team, my father-in-law, who's been rooting for the Raiders forever and just sitting there largely in discouragement and <laughs> depression uh, this year was a, was a beacon of joy up until recently. Uh, and you behold long enough, and what has happened? It stirs up in you. It becomes part of you. You're, like, invested. And so here... Isaiah says, behold the Lord. And as we come to Christmas, behold the Lord. Behold the Lord. Get stirred up. Get stirred up. 2 Corinthians 3. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Talking about Moses. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all have unveiled faces. Moses' face was veiled. Your face if you love Jesus, if you've confessed your sins, if the Spirit's filled you, you have an unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. What we behold transforms us. So we declare, we behold, and here at the end, it says in verse 11, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and lead those who are with young. We declare, we behold, and I think here at the end, we stand fast. We stand fast. We stand fast in what Jesus has done, that he's made a way that God has come to be with us, and that he is on the move. Right here, he will tend. 
He will gather. He will carry. He will gently lead. He's doing it. He's doing it. You're the sheep and he's the shepherd. And he's working and he's moving on our behalf. And just think about the narrative of the Bible of God calling people to himself. I was just thinking about this even this morning as I was just looking this over. God, even in, even in Eden, God calls them out of Eden and shows mercy to them. In Abraham, he calls them out of Ur, out of the, this Sumerian, like the first huge civilizations of the earth, and he calls this man out of nowhere from the ends of the earth and says, you. And the man says, okay, I'm going. He calls him. He gathers Israel out of nothingness, just these people wandering around in this arid, desert, war-filled land. And he's like, you. And they go. He calls them into Egypt and out of Egypt. Into Egypt so they'd survive, so they'd thrive, so they'd multiply. And then he calls them out into freedom. He calls them out of Sinai into a land that they should possess. He calls them out of exile, out of bondage, out of sin when they've been conquered and oppressed in captivity by their enemies. And then in the New Testament, he calls men and women who aren't even in the covenantal people of God. He calls the Gentiles out of the whole world and says, come, follow me, follow me. He will tend his flock. He will gather his lambs. He will carry them. He will gently lead. We declare what God has done. We behold God. We just behold him. We gaze intently at him. And we stand fast. Why? Because he's doing it. He's doing it. He's done it. He will do it again. God is the great mover. And he's, if you're here today, he's moved in your life. He's moving in your life. He will move in your life. And as we see so much throughout Scripture, I love how it, it, it closes this little section with us being sheep. That this is us. We're the sheep and he's the shepherd. And man, without the shepherd, what's ha what happens? The sheep scatter. We need him. And here again, as we come to this time of celebration, be stirred up as sheep over the great shepherd of your soul. The shepherd who watches over us, the shepherd who carries us. I love how this, this image here almost gets more and more intimate. He tends his flock. It's like there's the flock he's standing there tending. Then he gathers the lambs. Then he carries the lambs. Then he gently leads those who are with young. The most vulnerable, the weakest those that have no way of defending, some other translations say, those who are nursing. It's like he steps down and he says, I'm for you, the sheep. I'm for you. We declare, we behold, and we stand fast. Everyone beholds something. My neighbors there, they're great people, Jeremy and Ashley. What are they beholding? They're beholding a nice man-made holiday in which they have a lot of lights and they buy a bunch of stuff and they have a bunch of people over. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it's so shallow, so little compared to the truth that we have in us. So here, what do we come? We come and we declare God. We declare Emmanuel. We declare Christ with us. We behold him, we gaze intently at him, and then we stand fast. Stand fast. You're the sheep, he's the shepherd, and he's got you. You need to be led, he'll lead you. You need to be carried, he'll carry you. You're, you're nursing young, you're weak, you feel helpless, you're like, there's nothing I can do here, he'll tend you. Luke 1, he will be great, he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This is Christ. 
there will be no end to his kingdom. And here, as we come to Christmas, I think I pray the Holy Spirit will pray this in a moment at the end, will just give you some real insight of, man, what are some fresh ways, me and my family, me and my spouse, just me as an individual, what are some fresh ways I can behold and declare the goodness of God in this season? What are some fresh ways I can focus in on Christ? Because he will reign and his kingdom will have no end. And here at Christmas, we celebrate this kingdom coming in the form of a baby, helpless, to us, for us. We celebrate Christ Jesus who comes in the world to take away our sins, and we celebrate Christ Jesus who will come again to gather all those that are his. Amen? Beautiful, beautiful image. Christ is the great shepherd of the sheep, and we are his sheep, and we're called to declare, to behold, and to stand fast. Um, And even here this morning, I I pray that stirs you. I pray it really builds something inside of you. Uh, It's maybe a very simple truth. When I was preparing for this and just thinking about this, just reading it, it was just so simple, but yet it was good. It filled me up. It, It really blessed me. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arms rule for him. Behold, his recompense is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. There in the beginning, I didn't even mention that. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense is before him. Christ is coming and he has a reward. And he comes and he makes all things right. He rewards those he loves. He rewards those, just like I read that list, Abraham, he calls out those who hear the call of God and say, yes, there's a reward. There's a reward we listen to his voice and we obey his commandments, he comes and his reward is with him and his recompense, he'll make things right, is before him. I just want us in this season, I just want myself in this season, I want my family in this season, just to freshly look at Christ, just to be stirred up. If the world can be stirred up over nothing, let's be stirred up over the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Amen? I mean, yeah, we should be, the Danny said that, the most joyful people. Why? Because we have the joy of the Lord. We have the hope of the world. We have the good news. They don't have good news. We have it. And so I want to pray for you um, as we close this morning. And I just want to challenge you, you know, challenge you this week. Think about, man, what is some way as we approach this Christmas season, what's some way, even a simple way, how can I stir myself? my family up in the things of Christ, in looking and gazing and beholding Emmanuel, Christ with us. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Holy Spirit. We just ask, move in our midst, Lord Jesus. We just ask as we come today, Lord, just to this beautiful passage, Lord, I just pray, Lord, would you stir in us, Lord, a vision? Would you stir in us, Lord, just a move of the Spirit to come and declare the good things of God, to come and declare the good news of God. And I pray, Lord, would that declaration start believer to believer. Lord, that as here in this passage we read, we're called to go and declare to Judah. Lord, we're called to go and declare to the people of God the good news of God, Lord, that we need to hear the good news of God. Lord, we need to be refreshed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, stir us up. Lord, I just pray you would, you would stir in us declaration, Lord, and you would just stir in us a fresh vision just to gaze in wonder at Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit, I just pray even this week, Lord, just show us a fresh, Lord, whether it's worship, Lord, whether it's Advent, whether whatever it may be, Lord, some simple, small practice of prayer, of worship, of confession, of spending time in the Word, Lord, something fresh that we can do 
to fix our gaze on Jesus. Lord, as the world fixed their gaze on Christmas, Lord, help us to fix our gaze on the Christ of Christmas. Lord, help this to be a season in which we behold the wonders of Jesus with us. Lord, to behold the wonders of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who will sit on the throne of David forever and ever and ever and ever. And Lord Jesus, I just pray, Lord, would you just move, would you just have your way, Lord, as our shepherd? Lord, would we just be freshly stirred, Lord, that we are sheep and you're the shepherd. And Lord, we need you. Christ Jesus, we need you. Lord, we need you to lead us. We need you to tend us. We need you to carry us, Lord. We need you to gently lead us, Lord. We are helpless without you. So, Father, just move in our lives, Lord Jesus. Lord, may we feel your hand, your staff, Lord, your voice, Lord. Whatever it may be, Lord, we ask, lead us. And, Lord, we love you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you just for this truth, Lord, this simple truth. And, Lord, we just ask that you would stir it up in us afresh and that this would be a great season of remembrance, a great season of declaration of what you have done in the world through Christ. Lord, we love you in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Yes, this week you are challenged to fix your eyes on Jesus, behold him, gaze on him, um, be changed by continuing to keep your eyes on him. I'll share, I'll share with you where my mind went when, when thinking about beholding God. I, I often think about Isaiah chapter 6, and that great imagery there. Um, and then my mind also came to Revelation chapter 1. Um, I'm quite a visual person, and we're talking about beholding. This is where I'm going to go to. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. It begins with, behold. Behold, the one who's coming. And then Jesus speaks. If, if your Bible has red letters, verse 8 is in red. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Um, Christmas Christmas is, a, is kind of the easy one, isn't it? Because in Christmas, Jesus is a baby, right? The world doesn't mind Christmas because he's still just a baby in those images, the nativity scene. And a baby you can control. But Jesus is coming. And when he comes again, he's not coming as a baby. He's a king and a conqueror. And when we behold him, we, will, we should behold him as Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Yes, the one who was, but also the one who is, and the one who is to come, the Almighty. And then a few verses later, verse 12, John, who's, who's recording this vision, he turns. He says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His hair and his head were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That's what I'm going to be gazing at. The conqueror, the king, the beginning, the end, the almighty, the one who's perfect, who shines like the sun in all his brilliance, and when he speaks, it's like the sound of many waters. I encourage you this week, behold Jesus, the one who was and is and is to come. Amen?
God bless you. We'll see you next week. Have a great Thanksgiving.